rotation curves of galaxies. And I want to point out that uh, the, the places in the universe, in the galaxies in the universe that have most of the dark matter are actually the dwarf galaxies here is, a, is an example that are dominated by dark matter. And we have rotation curves for those galaxies too. There are only a few stars you see in the image on the right. But measuring the star velocity dispersion and, and the radial velocity of the gas with Doppler measurements, one can build the uh, velocity field on the sky and you see that there is a clear motion in one direction on one side of the, of the image and the uh, other direction on the other side. And so we'll build a rotation curve. And uh, that's really, they're really mostly made of, uh, of dark matter, but we can still measure things. Right? And uh, John Ellis mentioned a dark galaxy made completely of dark matter for which we only have access uh, through gravitational lensing. So we, we, we don't have dynamical measurements of, of, on dark galaxies. Now, what is remarkable about rotation curves of spiral galaxies is the regularity they present in their structure. So there is a relation between the amount of luminous matter and the amount of dark matter that, is, that again, is, I think, some, sometimes forgotten. And on the left is a compilation we're going, is a 10-year-old compilation. There are more galaxies known nowadays of rotation curves of spiral galaxies. And you see that some of them are flat, as, as the usual paradigm says, and many of them are still rising in the data. Now, if one plots in a three dimensions the, the dark matter fraction in, in mass in the galaxy versus the central density in dark matter versus the radius of the, of the galaxy, all spiral galaxies fall onto one curve. And this is an astonishing correlation that is not completely understood to this day in, in astrophysics. So if we have alternative theories of for dark matter or theories where dark matter does not exist, it would be welcome if this relation is explained. So not only the galaxies fall onto a single line, but also ranked by luminosity. That you can take luminosity as a parameter along this line. The galaxy clusters are made 83% uh, of, of mass in dark matter. But there is a small fraction of mass of about 5% that is not accounted for and should be there. And is in, we call them the missing baryons. Could we measure the density baryons on the larger scales using cosmological probes like the cosmic background? And but then when we go to galaxy clusters, they don't uh, appear about 5% of them. And there are some groups trying to find them, but it's not a hot topic nowadays. Only 10% of the mass is, in, is luminous in galaxy clusters. It brings me to this example that was also mentioned before and, the, and of the Bullock cluster, and there are a couple of other clusters that show the same phenomenology, where the claim is that it is cold dark matter we are seeing and not modified gravity is basically a symmetry argument so most of the mass in the, in the cluster is dark matter in the usual picture, and only a tenth of the mass is in gas, and a tenth of a tenth is in galaxies. So we see the galaxies with the, you know, like Hubble Space Telescope in the optical, and then we see the hot gas in X-rays. And it, the hot gas is in the middle, so they start to be you see two uh, galaxy clusters. You see the galaxies that have just crossed, and, and the gas got stuck in the middle. If we don't want dark matter, then that's the mass, and we're off by a factor of, of 10. And so you know, we have an, an alternative theory of gravity, and we have a gas at the center, but then we measure the gravitational potential through uh, weak lensing. We find it has two potential wells. So we would need a theory that has a central source, but a dipole field. And now most theories we write down respect spherical symmetry. So this is really a symmetry argument that uh, speaks in favor of the presence of cold dark matter in these clusters and not uh, modifications of gravity. If we look at the CMB scale, this is known physics. It's linear perturbation theory with general relativity, linearized, statistical mechanics at 10,000 Kelvin, one electron volt. We think we understand the physics 
uh, in this regime very well. And, and one can fit their uh, peaks and the structures in the CMB uh, with the cosmological model. And this is the result is our Planck uh, 2015 data. There's a little bit in, uh, uh, in uh, photons and ordinary matter, 30 picojoules per cubic meter. This is extraordinary also that it, at these days, when, when I was a student, we couldn't measure the uh, density of, of things in the universe, or the average density of cosmic density of things in the universe in physical units, but now we can do that. It's about 200 picojoules per cubic meter in cold dark matter and uh, about 500 picojoules per cubic meter in dark energy. And these uh, portions are distinguished by their equation of state, which is mentioned here, according to the pressure, relation between the pressure and the energy density. Now, uh, the evidence is for non-baryonic cold dark matter, and there are two reasons. So one is uh, the, this, one of the pillars of the Big Bang model, Big Bang nucleosynthesis which we measure the baryon to photon ratio uh, one minute after the Big Bang and then again uh, uh, 10 billion years later. And the data fit with theory. Here we see the, the theory prediction for, for the ratio of uh, abundance is deuterium to hydrogen and this up, up is helium-4 to, um, to uh, deuterium. And uh, we, we see that predictions of theory in green, and the CMB data one minute after the Big Bang in, in red, and the uh, stellar data in gray, and they all match. And they point to 84% of the matter being non-baryonic. And the historical argument for the non-baryonic nature of dark matter is the following, is a Gaussian formation. So by non-baryonic here in astrophysics, it means that they don't significantly interact with the plasma in the early universe, and the plasma is an electron positron plasma at this time. So electrons, positrons, and photons, the dark matter doesn't interact significantly with them. So this argument is that uh, in the early universe, when the, the baryons, uh, it includes the electrons, say the plasma is coupled to the radiation, the photons, then we have plasma oscillations, and the gravity cannot actually start to build structure, and we have to wait until the photons have decoupled from the plasma, that the combination, that's the time cosmic macro background has formed. And at that time, uh, gravity can start acting, and then there's not enough time to build uh, enough uh, structure in the universe. So we're off by a couple of orders of magnitude in the density of the galaxies that it would form. There's not enough time. But including dark matter, lets the, uh, the gravity uh, start forming structure at an earlier time, which is this matter radiation equality. And so dark matter, which is not participating in plasma oscillations, has the time to uh, form gravitational structures before the plasma decouples from the, from the photons. And, that, and this gains enough time to form the galaxy. So we do see this in the data. Here's a zoom in at this theoretical region with the plasma oscillations. It's this Sloan Digital Sky Survey data. We see uh, the, what we should would have the plasma oscillations in dashed line with no dark matter. And the actual data that instead show the presence of dark matter with small wiggles, which are the so-called baryon acoustic oscillations that have been uh, famous in, in cosmology and a, a residual of the plasma oscillations. But to go beyond the CMB, we need simulations. So we need to go from the CMB to the uh, uh, map of galaxies in the universe through an n-body simulation because gravity is, uh, is strong, isn't it? And uh, here it comes the distinction between cold and hot dark matter. So the structure on the left is, is cold, produced by cold dark matter, a structure on the right by hot dark matter. So you see the different, uh, uh, there are many filaments with hot dark matter and not so much structure on the smallest scales. We do observe cold dark matter, and here are the data from the compilation back in 2012. You see the mass scale on the horizontal axis and uh, the, the variance, so this is the, the, the matter power spectrum in, in cosmological parlance. At the larger scales for galaxy clusters and the uh, distribution of galaxies, we have the, these, these uh, uh, data that 
match this uh, concordance cosmological model represented by the dashed line. We can go down to the scale of large galaxies. So the cold dark matter distribution matches the observed mass distribution from galaxy clusters up to the Hubble horizon, from large galaxies to the Hubble horizon. So this is the prediction of the cold dark matter model. If we add a little hot dark matter, if we, say, if we had only hot dark matter, let me say, of a, a, like a a large neutrino of one electron volt, then this, the, this uh, spectrum would show a cutoff at, at the low scales, would be this, this uh, dotted line on, that I'm pointing to. And this is clearly incompatible with the observations. So this is the evidence for cold dark matter. Now, of course, we can try to put an intermediate case of warm dark matter if we just choose the scale so that we can fit the data at least down to the largest galaxies. So we have cold dark matter in the universe, and that's what I wanted to show you, remind you of these few important points about uh, why we believe in the existence of non-baryonic cold dark matter is based on empirical evidence. Of course, the question is what is uh, non-baryonic cold dark matter because no particle in the standard model is a good candidate. It either couples to the plasma or decays too fast uh, or, or it's hot dark matter like the case of the neutrinos. And there are many candidates available, and the, unfortunately, the uh, mass range and the interaction range are, are huge. The interactions because they've, that have been proposed go from only gravitational to the strong interactions, and the mass range goes from 10 to negative 59 kilograms to up to 10 to the plus 22 kilograms. And so one needs basically a little bit of a classification for these candidates into hot and cold and so on. So I already explained what hot, the difference between hot and cold dark matter is. It's based on the time of decoupling of the dark matter particles from the plasma. Now there are two kinds of decoupling that we talk about in the field. One is when the particles stop um, changing the number. That's called the chemical decoupling. So if we have a fixed number of particles that remain, we, we say they're, after, they're chemically decoupled. And then there's another decoupling called the kinetic decoupling. And that's the time when the momentum transfer stops, when the temperature of the dark matter and the plasma can be different. There's no heat transfer between the dark matter and the plasma anymore. And that is called kinetic decoupling. And it's the time of kinetic decoupling that sets the cold or hot nature of dark matter. So hot dark matter decouples kinetically when it's still relativistic and big structures form first, while well, cold dark matter decouples kinetically when it's non-relativistic and small structures form first and then merge. And we see cold dark matter. Another distinction between thermal relics and non-thermal relics. Now, thermal relics were in thermal equilibrium with the plasma in the early universe, and they were produced in collision of, or collisions of plasma particles, but non-thermal relics were simply were not. Now, what is the main difference for phenomenology? Well, thermal relics do not remember their history. So the thermal equilibrium is thermal equilibrium is thermal equilibrium. It doesn't matter what happened before. Once you're in a thermal equilibrium, that's your starting point. Non-thermal relics remember their history. So they remember if they were produced in the case of cosmic defects, in the case of heavy particles, they remember everything that happened before. So that's really the distinction besides the, the details of what is written on the slide. The distinction is about remembering the initial conditions or not. So here's a table of, uh, I'm gonna show you two tables actually to give you an idea of how many things enter the, uh, the determination of a good candidate for dark matter. So here is uh, uh, dramatic production, annihilation, scattering, or, or decay. You could have all these cases. Dark matter could be produced in plasma reactions from the case of decoupled species emitted from extended objects. It's just a selection of examples. And the production can be tested in collider searches or using the cosmic density in the universe. Annihilation, we could have self-conjugate dark matter, asymmetric dark matter. We could have a, a, different, um, uh, a difference between the dark matter and the anti-dark matter particle. For scattering, we can have elastic interactions, inelastic, short range, short range, long range, anything we can think of. There is collisionless dark matter, which is a standard cold dark matter, but there's also self-interacting dark matter, which has interaction cross-sections similar to 
the hadronic cross section. So you get um, for a proton is about one millibar per GeV, and that's roughly the uh, self interaction cross section of this kind of dark matter. And then dark matter could decay, or it could be stable, or it could decay and be long lived, or, or I'm going to show an example of an ensemble of show lived particles. When we go even more into detail, there are many other things. There are some factors affecting the particle dark matter cosmic density in the production mechanism, either in the plasma reaching reaction equilibrium, that's the WIMP freeze out, not reaching reaction equilibrium, that's the FIMP freeze in. Co annihilating with similar mass particles, like the neutral inels, could be produced in the case of non thermal particles like the gravitinos, that could be emitted from extended objects like the axions. Well, this the symmetry between dark matter and anti dark matter it could be, as I said, self conjugal or non self conjugal, like Dirac fermions, or maybe you know, the self conjugal Majorana fermions, the axions. Also, the Hubble expansion rate before nucleosynthesis, which is not measured. We don't know what happened to the universe before nucleosynthesis. We don't have any constraints. We could have sta non-standard cosmologies before nucleosynthesis, like low temperature, low temperature reheating, a kinetic phase dominated by the kinetic energy of a scalar field. We could, with our simple models of uh, the reheating of the universe after the end of inflation, the uh, entropy is very is basically zero, and we need to increase the the entropy so to reach the big bang. That's the reheating phase. So there are many models, many possibilities, and that is why there are so many uh, studies of dark matter. So let me go through uh, some of the candidates for dark matter. I'm going to start with the QCD axions, which you know, are based uh, and inspired by the strong CP problem. But QCD axions as, as dark matter arise in two ways, either hot produced in thermally in the early universe, these are mostly excluded by astrophysics. Or they're cold, produced in one of two ways, or both ways, by coherent field oscillations around the minimum of the potential, very similar to what happens to the inflaton field at the end of inflation. Axions could also be produced by the decay of topological defects called axionic string decays. These are not superstrings, these are, these are axion strings, topological defects in. Uh, in uh, quantum field theory. Now, the first part, the coherent production, is reasonably um, uh, good and uh, well understood, but the decay of topological defects is a very complicated calculation and quite uncertain. And the, the last computer simulation was by a Japanese group in 2012, and still we don't understand all of the details. So it is a summary plot. If we we can boil down the axiom parameter space to two parameters, which allows us to plot it on a, on a sheet of paper. The expansion rate at the end of inflation on one axis and the Pacheco-Quinn symmetry breaking on the other axis. There are two regimes when the PQ symmetry breaks before inflation and when it breaks after. When it breaks before inflation, we have uh, non isocurvature fluctuations in the universe that uh, uh, are incompatible with the data from the cosmic background. And so most of the region is in yellow here is excluded, except for some chunk on the left side where the uh, Pacheco scale breaking is relatively high, but not too high. And, and the inflation ends at relatively low energies. The other side of, the, uh, of this diagram, when the PQ symmetry breaks after inflation, is what is more, most commonly discussed. In this case, uh, the, the, the mass of the dark matter axion would be around 70 microelectron volts, so there are no, no better calculations, but this is a ballpark, uh, several tens of microelectron volts. In the case, there are no, there's no production from axionic strings. Then the axionic strings add an uncertainty, which is here parameters by this factor alpha d, which is the fraction of axions axion produced in the case. And according to the range of simulations, the, the mass can go from uh, the 70 micro V up by an order of magnitude. 
this is the mass scale on the right, which is inversely proportional to the, to the PQ symmetry breaking scale. So large masses are at the bottom and small masses at the top. But that, this is the, the range that is expected nowadays between, say, around 100 microEV. The ADMX experiment, which is one of the, um, uh, maybe even the only one experiment that has actually been probing uh, axon cold dark matter, probes masses which are, fa masses which are a factor of 10 lower. And the reason for this is, 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 is just incredible. Um, this experiment was, um, uh, was shooting at dark matter axions that have a density omega equal to one. However, we know nowadays that omega cold dark matter is a tenth of that, 0 0.1. So that's the reason why ADMX is looking for omega equal one while the dark matter has omega equal 0 0.1. And we're rough by a factor of 10. So uh, the there, there next generation ADMX will get closer to the actual range, but new techniques will be needed in the future. And that's shown here. So, so this is the, the range of masses that, that where we think the QCD axiom will be cold dark matter. And this is challenging. And, and this is where ADMX is sitting. And next generation ADMX will get into this in the future. This is 2020 is the year mark here. WIMPs. Now, WIMPs uh, have been dominating the market of uh, uh, dark candidates because of fundamentally this region. One can, uh, the, the same physical process that produces the right density of WIMPs make the detection possible. So one can experimentally test the idea of WIMPs. They are produced thermally in the L universe in uh, collisions in the plasma, electron positron, muon, antimuon produce uh, WIMP, anti WIMP uh, pairs. And the wind production ceases when the production rate becomes smaller than the Hubble expansion rate. This is a famous freeze out. And after freeze out, there's a constant number density, co moving number density of, of WIMPs. So here's, this is the power of the WIMPs. This is diagram that was shown by Janelle earlier, too. So annihilation and production fix the cosmic density of the WIMPs to the right value. But production allows the production of WIMPs at colliders. Annihilation allows for their detection indirectly from the halo of, of galaxies or, or from uh, stars, if they get into stars. And if we cross the diagram, we have scattering, which uh, allows the direct detection in the laboratory or, and, and fixes the cold nature of, of these particles because it fixes the, the time when heat exchange stops in the other universe. Massive neutrinos were the first to WIMP candidate back in 1977. There was, there was some Russian papers before this uh, too. But they were excluded in, in the early 90s, so a combination of LiPo data and uh, direct searches. The sterile neutrino dark matter has been uh, talked about recently because of uh, the possibility that it has been detected in, uh, in uh, clusters of galaxies. So the, the sterile neutrinos would be warm dark matter with a mass larger than 300 electron volts. And here's the neutrino minimal standard model by Shaposhnikov and collaborators with two parameters, the mixing angle on one axis and the mass of the particle on the other. And this is where we would like to be in this white region. So there are, this is an unidentified 3.5 keV X-ray line that has been reported in galaxy clusters and the Andromeda galaxy. And here you can see the line, you can judge yourself if you believe this or not. Of course, you need a lot of uh, um, software to understand what produces the, the spectrum in this region. And this is where the Stellar neutrino will lie in this uh, diagram. So it, it's not excluded by, any, by the theories. So what, what, is this, what will, are we looking for is the radiative decay of a sterile neutrino, so sterile neutrino into photon and active neutrino. This is not the dominant annihilation channel, but is the, the dominant channel for detection because it produces a photon, X ray photon. So this uh, uh, line has uh, been tested by the Utomi satellite, which unfortunately was lost. But the early data uh, on the Perseus cluster do not show an X-ray line with expected strength. So the jury is still out. We don't, we don't know if there are, there's actually there is a 3.5 keV line at, a, at any significant level and beyond that if it is due to sterile neutrinos. Yes. Yes. It was, um, 
Well, not all of warm dark matter is ruled out, so 3.5 keV is still, still okay. So if we go back, Here. This is 0.2 PV, so 3.5, this is uh, 10 times this. So you see, as the mass increases, we get, we get better, the fit gets better and better, no problem. So 3.5 keV is okay with this data, and you can test it to, in small galaxies, which is actually what people are suggesting. You, know, you go into smaller galaxies, and there will be an effect of the sterile neutrinos. It would solve some of the uh, uh, troubles with cold dark matter simulations, like the cusp problem and so on, that some people believe are serious problems. I personally don't, but, but this warm dark matter would help in that direction. So the mass is okay. The dwarfs. The dwarf galaxies. What do you mean, the count? Yeah, one, one of the... Um, not the number directly with the warm dark matter, but the, the, the shape of the, uh, uh, of the halo uh, profile would change. Okay, so that, that was it for the sterile neutrinos. So we move to supersymmetric dark matter. Now, the, the, the constrained minimum supersymmetric standard model is in dire straits, but there are many supersymmetric models. And uh, the story is that the news have been reporting the supersymmetry is dead, but that is fake news in the modern terminology. So the, the standard, here's a Venn diagram of uh, just the supersymmetric, simply supersymmetric models. You get the standard model with 18 free parameters. And then like here we have the minimal supersymmetric standard model with minimal particle content with 124 parameters, including complex parameters. So that, that is this, this region here. And within it, we could say, well, okay, well, maybe all parameters are real and it's 63. Maybe we, understand, we want to impose some way of breaking supersymmetry, maybe uh, uh, gauge mediated, anomaly mediated, or we want pure gravity mediation. We want split SUSY, minimal SUGRA, and so on. And we, only if we make the you know, most predictive theory, we get down into the constrained minimal supersymmetric standard model, which is a great model to make predictions, yeah, but it shouldn't be the only standard for, to search for supersymmetry. So here, for example, is, the, uh, is a study a couple of years ago by uh, Bramante and collaborators uh, on uh, neutral inner dark matter with decoupled heavy spermions. And the reason I show this is that the claim is that it's not excluded by current experiments, but it will be tested completely if one would build a 100 TeV proton-proton collider. And one can see in this graph one can see the, um, all uh, attacks on, uh, on, on uh, dark matter candidates. At the colliders, LEP, indirect detections, has and gamma rays, and direct detection LUX. And they all exclude parts of this parameter space. And then, as I said, maybe in the future we can exclude it all, or probe it all, and maybe find supersymmetric dark matter. Here's an example uh, of another WIMP. It goes back to 1985, Silvera Z. This is not supersymmetric. There's a gauge single scalar field S that is stabilized by a Z2 symmetry. It's added to the standard model and is a Higgs Porton model. The interaction is through this, through ordinary particles through this quartic term to uh, Higgs, standard model Higgs fields and uh, uh, to, uh, to S square. This model has many names. Uh, the original name was Scalar Phantom. That's why I call it Scalar Phantom. Nowadays, it may be known as the Singlet Scalar Higgs model, but it, it really does many, many names. But the Lagrangian is clear. This is the most recent study by the Gambit Collaboration, which published this pair maybe, I don't know, it was a, maybe a month ago. They do global likelihood fits including collider direct and indirect searches and cosmology. And this is the result, a profile likelihood in the two parameters that appear in the Lagrangian, the mass of the singlet scalar and the coupling of the singlet to the standard model Higgs. The two graphs here, one is logarithmic on the right, it shows the whole parameter space. The other is linear and shows just this leftmost part of, of the graph. 
where the resonance region is. The maximum likelihood point is here and the, the little star and in the, in the yellow are regions of highest likelihood. Well, you can take home whatever you wish from these graphs. It's a likelihood study, so it shows that uh, it's still viable in some regions of parameter space. Another model I want to point out is the anapole dark matter. Now, the anapole moment is a CMP violating uh, electromagnetic moment, but it's CP conserving, it was pointed out by, theoretically by Zildovich in 1957, and has been observed experimentally in cesium atoms in 1997. So this is real physics. Then we can make some creative physics and say that dark matter has an anapole uh, moment and no other electromagnetic moment. For example, we can implement it with a spin one half Majorana fermion. What it means basically is that there is a coupling between the coil of the magnetic field and the spin of the particle. Now, the coil of the magnetic field is the is electric current, if you use Maxwell's equation. So it's a coupling between elect electromagnetic current and the spin. What makes this model interesting is that it passes, uh, the, it may can make the down modulation compatible with other searches for wind dark matter. And I'm going to come back to this point. Let me go through some other candidates like self interacting dark matter. It's been proposed to solve some of the problems and simulations. This is the, this is the range of cross section. I said is almost uh, uh, hadronic cross sections so within a factor of 10. So the limits are on the order of a fraction of a centimeter square per gram. Again, it's a fraction of a millibar per GeV. There are several theory models to embed this into, into a particle physics theory and not just have it phenomenological at the level of cross-section. Another example is asymmetric dark matter, which is dark matter in a hidden sector, the dark sector. And the, the key here is that there's a dark matter asymmetry generated similarly to the baryon asymmetry. And so the number density of asymmetric dark matter is comparable to the number density of matter. And then because of the mass difference that is imposed on these models, we get the, some ratio, the, the observed ratio between the densities. So there's a lot of literature on this, and I'm not going to spend any other time on this, on this thing. But I want to show you some curiosity. So this is a model called dynamical dark matter by uh, Keith Deans and collaborators. And this uh, is, is a kind of a, you know, just to make people think, in my opinion. So the, the, the question there was to ex, uh, ex, f explain the positron excess in, in, a, in, a, in, the co in cosmic rays. And the, the, what people usually say is that if we see a cutoff in the spectrum in future data, then we know it is due to dark matter because dark matter has a has mass and there can be no photons produced at, at energies higher than its mass. But if we don't see a cutoff, then it is astrophysical origin. That's the usual thing. This model shows that statement doesn't hold to uh, if one is really critical. So here we have a vast ensemble of fields decaying one into the other at different times. And there's a scaling law imposed so that the decay rates are connected. So this is the, the scaling law. There's a, the density goes uh, here, the, the mass of the particles goes with some, uh, the splitting, let's say, of the particle goes with some power. It's a geometrical progression. Once this is done, and uh, so the density is obtained by adding the densities of all these particles that decay. And in this conspiracy, we have dark matter that produces a positron spectrum that has no cutoff. So I wanted to show you this as a reminder that what I, what I think really will tell us what the dark matter is, is really the observations. Observations plus a model and more observations of the same model, and not just looking at one example like the positron excess here and making up a, a theory because it's possible to make theories that explain the data, whatever the data are. Do we have signals from non-baryonic dark matter? Too many, I would say. So he has a lot of searches, collided, direct, indirect. 
In colliders, we don't see, we typically don't see the dark matter particles because they're neutral, electrically neutral. So we see some cousins of, of, of these particles in there. Uh, like in supersymmetry, we would see the charginos, not the neutralinos. And in other cases, this is a, we could search for missing energy. These are mono X searches, the mono jets, and so on. In direct detection, we have the scattering of WIMPs of nuclei or electrons in detectors in the laboratory, low background detectors. For axions, the, the traditional way in ADMX has been the conver Primakov conversion of axions into uh, photons in a magnetic field, in a cavity. There are new ideas, and I, I like, interesting. what I find interesting is, is that coherent, coherent axion fields, which would represent the dark matter in the galaxy, act as an electromagnetic current. If you add the axions into Maxwell's equations, this is how they appear. And so there are experiments like Casper that use hyperpolarized targets in, in a magnetic field to look for nuclear magnetic resonance induced by the axions passing through the detector. And there are very, very similar ideas that are under development nowadays, but they, they, there's no actual experiment. This is all R&D on, on the right-hand side. The only experiments existing is ADMX using resonant cavities. There's a whole other field called axion-like particles that I'm not mentioning here, where, uh, where there's more freedom. Those axion-like particles don't need to be the dark matter. So there you have a lot of experiments, laboratory experiments, but not for dark matter. In indirect searches, we search for rare cosmic, uh, rare astrophysical uh, particles like uh, specific gamma rays or positrons or antiprotons, and either from our galaxy, other galaxies, the sun or the earth. Uh, there are many of these experiments. So here's a slide that changes every year I, I give talks. And it shows some of the signals from dark matter question mark like GeV gamma rays, 3.5 kV extra line that I mentioned earlier, the cosmic ray positrons, and the annual modulation in the ray detection by the Tama experiment. So I'm going to go through just two of these, the gamma ray excess. So this is what we expect to see in the gamma ray sky from, uh, from dark matter from uh, um, um, a self-conjugate WIMP. This is the J factor in the formula for the uh, photon flux. There's an annihilation cross-section and spectrum of the photons, and then there's this intensity given by the integral along the line of sight of the square of the density, and there's a square because the particle is a self-conjugate particle equal to the antiparticle. We expect to see higher density at the galactic center and then fading down. Then we expect to see emission from dwarf spheroidal galaxies that harbor a small number of stars and are otherwise dark in, in gamma rays. Maybe from dark matter clumps that have no baryons. And maybe also from exagalactic sources of dark matter. So the 1GV gamma ray excess has been around uh, starting in 2009 when the Fermilat discovered uh, that there were more gamma rays than the models predicted at the time from the direction of the galactic center. And that's the statement at the moment. This is still there. There are more gamma rays observed than predicted in the current models of cosmic rays. This is a 2016 publication, 2015 on the archive, and 16 the actual publication by the Fermilat collaboration that shows the, an excess in the count of gamma ray photons from the galactic center. This is all with respect to what is known to the physical models, which, and this is really hard to model uh, cosmic rays on the galactic plane and especially at the galactic center. Really hard. It's a, one of the biggest challenges in, in cosmic ray physics. So this is from the official analysis that, that I just mentioned, the, the um, Fermilat collaboration. They, they do a residual over model here. The statement is an, ex, an extended residual is present, but a precise physical interpretation of its origin is premature. Now, to stress this point, here's a paper uh, this year, 2017, it shows a compilation of uh, uh, measurements of this galactic center excess. Let me guide you through this slide. The, the, the current measurement is this Fermilat, Fermilat 2017 in blue. You have to follow the blue lines. But the previous results, I, the previous slide was 
this 2016, according to two uh, possibilities of the, of the models, in green or in, or in pink. And the systematic uncertainty is blue band, huge systematic uncertainty. So here's, here fits to the dark, or dark matter to the excess. There's a little problem with small uh, energies. But uh, you know, it's possible for a dark matter particle around G, uh, changing EVE, uh, maybe a B, going into BB bar and specific halo models. The competitor from astrophysical explanation is millisecond pulsars and is actually favored by wavelength analysis, non Poissonian point spread functions, and there are currently ideas and, and um, uh, proposals out to actually go and find these pulsars. And if we compare this gamma ray uh, signal from the galactic center with other observations of gamma rays like those spheroidals, then the galactic center signal lies at the borderline of, of possibilities. So this is the dark matter mass and the annihilation cross section. From this graph, people often say that uh, you know, if you compare with the thermal relic cross section here, you say that uh, uh, WIMPs uh, lighter than 100 GeV are excluded. This is not true in general. This is only valid for S wave annihilation. And, and a lot of theories have P wave annihilation, not S wave annihilation. So, for example, here's a, some supersymmetric model from the past, and you see the predictions that they just they avoid these bounds. They don't have S wave annihilation. Let me move to the Dharma annual modulation which is another of these things that have been around for many, many years, from 1997 onward, is a, there's a, statistically there is a modulation, no doubt, nine sigma detection for over many, many years. We expect such a modulation from WIMPs just due to the motion of the Earth around the Sun, so you get a higher flux when the Earth and Sun move together in the galaxy and a lower flux when, when they move in opposite directions. These are the uh, slides directly from uh, Pelowicz Valley of Dharma, um, and I use them because it shows what they actually do. So what we need to focus on is this graph on the bottom right. This is a periodogram. So we t take the time axis and fold it back every year so that each month occurs at the same position on the graph. And then put the counts. And in, in green are the, uh, the control counts, called multiple heat events that are certainly not due to dark matter. They don't show any pattern. And in red are the single heat events, which may be due to dark matter, and they show this modulation. And then when you look at the properties of the modulation, you find whether well, the phase is, is one year, the, no, I'm sorry, the period is one year, the phase is, is what we expect in, in, in like in, in the HALO models, the spectrum of recoil energies fits what we expect. So it's kind of a mystery. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the question mark is really, what is this modulation due to? The, the problem with the dark matter interpretation is, is this one, that uh, if we say that there's a spin independent interaction in standard ELO model, then the down modulation signal is completely excluded by current searches. So here is a, 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 a wind nuclear cross-section versus wind mass, and the magenta are the current best limits from Quest to CDMS Light, Super CDMS, Panda X, and Xenon 1 ton, that is a new limit that is better than, than LUX. And so they exclude this gamma signal and say, well, maybe the interaction is spin-dependent, so you do the same exercise on the left is with neutrons, on the right with protons, and the gamma signal is also excluded. And again, here you see the best limits, this is lax. I need to stretch the figure down because the progress in the field. And on the right is a combination, the best limits are a combination of you know, ice cube indirect limits and uh, PICO-60 direct detection and accelerator limits, ATLAS and CMS, which probe the same uh, couplings. Notice that the accelerator limits are very strong at low masses and then pan out at large masses. I'm going to explain why that is. So you can say, well, maybe this interaction with electrons is the same story. It doesn't work. Gamma signal is excluded. So this brings me to the last part of my talk, which is recent trends. This is what has been happening. And I think historically, because of this down modulation, trying to explain down modulation with compatibility with their experiments, the, the news about supersymmetry is dead or is bad, so this is what happened. Make no assumptions. Consider all particle physics models and all astrophysical models. Consider all possible interactions between dark matter and standard model particles, and this program has been carried out in some limits. Or for astrophysics, there are hello independent methods of analysis that ideally require no assumption on the astrophysical properties of dark matter. I'm going to quickly say what techniques are used here. It's effective operators for, for the uh, theory part. 
this is analogous to, uh, to having a Fermi beta decay theory. And effective operators are applicable if the mediator mass is much larger than exchanged energy. There are many possibilities, and interference is important, and it's not always neglected. There are some, so here's uh, early calculations in 2010 for effective operators that are relevant for both LHC and direct detection. You just have a table, and you can analyze one of these at a time. So, for example, here's a coupling of, of, uh, of a spin one half uh, dark matter with the gluons. And accelerator bands are very good at low masses because at, at accelerator energy, like uh, the, uh, a mass of 10 GeV or or one GV is just massless, so, so they, this bounds extend to low masses, no problem. And they stop at large masses when the, this is beyond the kinetic limit of uh, the kinetic energy of the accelerator. Direct detection limits have the opposite behavior because there's a minimum re recall energy detectable in experiments, so there's a minimum kinetic energy the WIMP must have. But that kinetic energy of the WIMP in a galaxy is bounded by the escape speed from the galaxies. Like if the WIMP has uh, too much kinetic energy, it would be gone from our galaxy. So effectively, that's, uh, that eliminates the beam at low masses. We don't have fast WIMPs that we can see in detectors. So that, that's why these shapes are always similar. These searches for uh, with effect, WIMPs with effective couplings continue to these days. This is CMS collaboration paper in 2016 showing uh, limits on the uh, coupling of WIMPs with W bosons, for example. And for direct detection, the, uh, the, a list of all possible um, uh, non-relativistic Hamiltonian terms has been written down in, in this series of papers. They're being all classified. And uh, their connection to simplified models has been worked out. This is a table if you have a simplified model with some interaction, some current at the relativistic uh, level, then you have to map it down into these operators with these numbers. And the phen phenomenological studies have been done already. This is an, in, uh, uh, limits from experimentalist super CDMS on each of these effective operators. And on the left is a study I did a few years ago of correlations between operators. And, and our conclusion was that when we, have, we will have data, then, then we, something could be said at the moment, not, not much. And there's also studies in indirect detection and so on. This continues. And the next step in this endeavor is to connect the effective operators at the non-relativistic level to the fundamental theory. And this has to go through the nuclear matrix elements of the quarks and gluons. And it, it, there are some uh, compilations of these, but they're incomplete. So that's where the, that's the status of this endeavor. And for astrophysics independent methods, the idea is that in these limit plots, the astrophysics and the particle physics are fixed. The astrophysics to the standard Taylor model, which is maybe a spherical cow of direct wind searches, but we don't know much about the velocity distribution despite simulations. So the idea was to leave the astrophysics arbitrary and use the dark matter flux or a proxy for the dark matter flux called the velocity integral given by this integral over the velocity distribution and on one axis as a function of its natural variable, which is the integration limit, and the upper bounds appear as regions excluded above the line, claim signals as, as points. And this program has been implemented in successive stages, the first by Foxley Weiner, who had the initial idea that you can just uh, uh, compute this uh, velocity integral from the event rate. However, there's no uh, unique relation between the measured energy and the wind speed. You can map the, the data to this B-mean, uh, unambiguously, uh, unless uh, special cases which were done here. And that uh, still allows people to go, do weighted averages of the velocity integral. This is improvement on the previous work. And with those weighted averages, two models were found that are compatible with, make DAMA compatible with other signals, the anapole dark matters that I mentioned earlier, and the exothermic dark matter here, which is a particle, just two particles species in the dark matter, one is a little bit lighter than the other, 70 kV mass difference, and they have a mass of 3 GeV. So they, these methods allow for any velocity or energy dependent cross-section and also being used for neutrinos from the sun and the earth. Alternatively, one has sampled discretized velocity distributions to find some, some bounds, but the most recent event has been uh, the introduction of new powerful techniques by myself and Stefan Skopel uh, this year, which is inspired by probability theory, so the problem of moments and Chebyshev inequalities. So these methods are very powerful, and as first application, what we did, 
we figured out the hello independent gamma unmodulated signal. The qu question was, uh, it was repeatedly said in the literature that uh, the gamma modulation cannot be due to dark matter because the, the non-modulated dark matter signal will be too high beyond the measured uh, levels. And that is not true. So we, we figured out with this method we have, the, you can see in this figure, the gamma modulation spectrum are reconstructed to uh, unmodulated signal. And from the table here, you see that it is a factor of 10 below the signal plus, plus background. Measurement. So the unmodulated signal in gamma is compatible with the background. What will happen in the next future? We will have uh, we're Gaia's taking uh, data on, on uh, about a 1 billion stars in the galaxy, and this may produce uh, uh, results on substructures in the galactic halo. The Dark Energy Survey and the LSST uh, telescope will map the large scale distribution of dark matter and this growth with time. So, this again will correlate the properties of dark matter and uh, especially important for indirect detection. Gamma has been taking data for about six years. I think they're going to wait another year because they were they had seven in the, in the previous release. So, they probably wait to seven years before they release the data, but they have a lower threshold. So, that's interesting. We'll still see the signal. And other experiments are catching up with Dama. There's a, an NIS uh, um, Sabre and Cosine 100, which is a Korean US collaboration. And the, the Cosine 100 is taking data now, the preliminary data where the, the, the detector is running. And uh, so we will see independent tests with the same uh, target. And we have bigger and bigger Xeno detectors. We have just results from Xeno 1T. We we'll have uh, bigger xenon, uh, NT, we have LZ, Darwin, and so on, and we'll reach down to the, all the possibilities. In gamma rays, uh, CTA, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, promises a lower energy threshold, higher sensitivity, so compared to the current excluded region in, in pink, it will go down by about an order of magnitude. And finally, AMS uh, has been producing exquisite data on cosmic rays, and the precision of this data is so high, it is the theory that is lagging behind. The, the data will have 1% precision up to iron and 100 GV per nucleon. So my opinion here is that the AMS data will serve to pinpoint the model of cosmic ray propagation in the galaxy, cosmic ray propagation and production in the galaxy. That should be the first step before any excess is claimed over what we understand, because we don't understand what we think we understand. So, summary. There is overwhelming astrophysical evidence for non-baryonic cold dark matter. The nature of cold dark matter is still unknown. There are too many candidates being proposed. There are some controversial claims of detection. And we will see more measurements in the future. Thank you. Anapol, yes. Yes, that's the reason. So the anapole cross-section, I don't think it appears on my slides, but the anapole cross-section has a velocity-dependent term and also depends on the uh, transferred energy because that's basically, okay, it's coupled to the magnetic field of the target and the, the form factor is the Fourier transform of the magnetic field. And so nuclei have different magnetic fields around them. So, so the cross-section is both an energy de transfer dependence and a velocity dependence. So by changing the uh, velocity distribution of the dark matter, one can change the relative rates in different experiments. That, that's how it, it works. You said there's going to be a new release of Dharma data. In a well, maybe in a year, I hope. I don't know. I'm not part of Dharma. Well, but what, what additional information could that be expected to bring? Uh, uh, because they lower the, th the threshold, so they're going to go in there. Um, if you remember, the recall spectrum has a bump, has an increase a low, a near threshold, which is where it's expected, and then there's another point that's a little bit below. So people wonder, is that just a bump? Or, or does it continue to raise the lower energies, which we, is what we would expect from dark matter models? So they're going to probe this. I see no more questions, so let's thank Paulo again and go for lunch.